Hey YouTube, I'm Ali, this is Gaming Indoors, and today we're talking about taking a finished prototype to a manufacturer. What are the steps? How long does the process take? What are the costs involved? Oh, there are so many questions, hopefully, that are gonna be answered in this video. Now, the right thing to do here, of course, uh, is to uh, to ask these questions to the right person. And who better to answer them than someone who actually owns a manufacturing company, uh, one that specializes in board games. And that's exactly what we're gonna be doing today. Now, just before we kick off the interview, I do want to give a little bit of context. Uh, and to help uh, with that, I'm using this uh, graphic here. Uh, this shows the different processes that are involved in the actual production of a board game. Uh, and today, we're going to be talking about step one, which is highlighted in red here. Um, we're talking about how you engage with the manufacturer, what they do in terms of design and the graphics uh, that eventually you'll be supplying them, um, the production of a sample, and a little bit about the preparation time required for actual production. That all happens in step two, and then we talk about shipping and fulfillment in step three. Now, steps two and three are gonna be separate conversations because, like I said, there's so much involved. This video is just about step one, which is the overall view and um, the initial engagement. Okay, so with the context set, let's get on with the interview. First, of course, introductions. Uh, my name is Hirsch. I've been living in China for the past six years. Um, since childhood, I always played board games. And I love them. And uh, two, three years back, my brother made his own board game and he needed manufacturing and he had a lot of problems with it. Um, as I was in China already, I just decided to help him out and find a couple of factories. Um, after his game, I learned so much about board games and the way they are manufactured. And I realized that this industry, like with my brother, we had a lot of trouble getting transparent pricing and understanding what the price is made of so we can make good calculated decisions for our games. And that's when more or less I realized that everyone in the industry have these problems. Now, what I loved about Hirsch is that he didn't just sit there and say, okay, the system's not very good, but I'll do the best I can. No, Hirsch took action. Two years ago or in 2019, I decided to open my own place, my own factory up in Iwu. In the beginning, it was a very, very small workshop. It still is not too big. But, um, but my point was, I needed to understand when I opened it. And the reason why I opened it is because I needed to understand exactly how the prices are calculated and what they are made of. And I needed full control of the supply chain. So if I chose to work with a different manufacturer, he would have kept me in the dark, made me rely on him completely. And then um, I wouldn't be able to change anything I don't like. Um, obviously, each factory works with different standards. So I mean, I want, my goal was when I opened my factory, I want the highest standard as poss possible, lowest price as possible. And for me to reach that, I really had to understand everything about board games, how they're made, um, what is the price entails in each component. And I think after a year of experience uh, with making board games, I came to the point where, yes, I do understand 90% of everything that goes into board games and their manufacturing. Straight off the bat, I knew I was going to like Hirsch. I often talk about uh, the people I interview having a huge amount of passion and knowledge and generosity when it comes to understanding the hobby. Hirsch had that both about manufacturing and about the hobby, and that's what really appealed to me. He was able to tie together not just the business processes and the manufacturing processes, but the actual expected outcomes of what you would want as a hobbyist when it comes to board game production and actually tie them two together really, really well. It's more than just speaking to someone in a suit. It was very much speaking to someone who loves board games and then has turned that love into a meaningful uh, business, in effect, by producing board games for other people. Now, enough of that. Let's get on to the actual topic of, uh, of engaging with a manufacturer. When should a designer actually reach out and speak to a manufacturer? I think it totally depends on the designers. There are two types of designers. Um, one is a, like a lot of the Kickstarter designers who want to build their game as, as best as they can and make it grandiose. Um, and they don't really care for the prices because they're not in the business of making money. They're only in the business of creating a beautiful board game that will leave a beautiful memory with all the other players. Um, and then you have the other type of designers uh, which work for like big companies or even individuals that are getting into the business to actually 
generate an income from that game. And they need to uh, make sure their game is as low cost as possible while uh, maintaining the highest of value or margins for their profits. Um, so you have two types of designers. Um, if you're a Kickstarter designer and you really wanna make a super prestigious game, I would suggest to first make your game, design it, have all the components ready in your mind, even if it's like a bunch of components. And then together with the manufacturer, and this is something that needs to be together. Um, you get on a call, okay? Because through emails, it will never happen. But you get on a call and you walk through the components. The manufacturer will give you ideas of what you can, uh, you know, what costs the most, what, what you can change a little bit. If the uh, size of the board games are too big, maybe make them a little smaller. So after you have a list of components in your mind, before you make the art, before you make the art, or before you finish the art, talk to a manufacturer uh, because then the manufacturer can really give you an idea, change that board size. You know, sometimes people come and they say, and their board size is like 57 centimeters. But if your board is like so wide, we have to use a huge paper for it and you lose a lot of money. So if you had the manufacturer on your side, before you started the artwork, the manufacturer would have told you, listen, make the board 54 centimeters and it will be in the right price target, right? Um, so. So after you have a list of components, before you do the artwork, that's when you should talk to the manufacturer. Just go over all the components to see that they all match your goal and, and, and the target that you have in mind for price. So the key piece for me there was really understanding that if I engage with the manufacturer early on, that I'm probably gonna reap benefits very quickly. If I wait until the last minute, then I'm probably gonna have to redo a bunch of things, especially if I've already uh, done the artwork. And what was really good to hear was that the manufacturer is willing to help providing you turn up early. Now, that all said and done, is a manufacturer uh, such as his own company, Hero Time, is that really the right place to go to for everyone? The minimum print run for a standard manufacturer is 500 cents. Some manufacturers start with 1,000, um, but then the rest is, is minimum of, of 500 cents. So if you want to just make a small print run for uh, your game, for friends, yourself, your family, um, the Game Crafter is an amazing, solu amazing solution. Um, the reason why they, they can do such small print runs is they have different machinery. Um, so rather than using an offset machine, which is like humongous, right? And you got to make printing plates and you got to install the printing plates and adjust the machines and adjust the colors, which all takes a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, they have a digital machine, which costs like a million dollars, yeah? and they can print like two pieces of that uh, piece of art. Now, the digital machine and the offset machine work very differently. So in the digital machine, the papers will be a lot smaller. So if, if like in the offset machine, you can fit 78 cards, and the digital machine you will be able to fit 18 cards. So there's a difference over there. Um, and you, it, but, but yeah, the Game Crafter, I believe, at the moment is the best one I know for small print ones. If you want to go for like 500 and up, then a standard normal manufacturer uh, can also help you out. Um, another reason why it's a little more complicated to make a game, because for the manufacturer, we need to make sure the art is correct. We need to go and make the plates. We need to install the machine. We need to print it. Then we need to take all the components. Um, yeah, um, tune up the lamination machine or the poke oil machine, set it, set it up, put the paper in. For us, making 10 sets and making 500 sets is the exact same amount of work. You know, the only difference is we need to wait five more minutes for 500 sets. So it's really not worth it for a large manufacturer to take all these resources and just use them for 10 sets. Now, as I spoke with her, she became very apparent that one of the things a manufacturer really wants to understand from day one is the likely cost of your end product. How much do you want to spend on actually getting your um, game built? And it's difficult for someone like me to be able to explain that. So I needed a reference point. I asked Hirsch um, to help me understand what the likely costs were for different types of game. This is what he came back with as a response. Um, so if you go to a board game shop, all the board games that have like multiple components, six and more components, like I said, the player boards, uh, the main playing board, decks of cards, dice, uh, wood components, maybe plastic tokens. Um, take, for example, terraforming Mars. Uh, take, for example, underwater cities. Um, 
all these large, man, there's so many of them, yeah, but all these large games, they usually are priced in retail, 55 to 60 US dollars. That's your average price. Um, then you have other games that have maybe like playing boards, maybe a map, they have some cards, maybe another one or two components like uh, dice or, or wood components, but not too many of them, you know? Um, they will be priced in retail around $30, 35 US dollars, more or less. And then you have this lower price bracket, which is $20, right? Uh, and that's simply cards. So you will have like two decks of cards and maybe, maybe like wood components with it, but generally like two components and that's it. So they will be priced $20 and that's in retail. Now, when you want to calculate your target price, you want to divide that retail price by five, or if you can buy five, by at least four. Um, because it, it's customary uh, landed cost by that. I mean, you want to say my landed cost of the game should be a quarter of or a fifth of the total retail price. And that's how usually large publishers work because they sell through retailers and they double their, their profits, so, so their costs. So if the game landed cost them $10, they will sell it to the retailer for $20 and the retailer will turn around and sell it for $40. That's how it works. Um, so you wanna do it like fifth of the retail price or uh, a at least fourth of the retail price. Now that's big publishers and that's why they're a lot more organized. Okay, but what if I'm going for a Kickstarter, for example, and I don't have a retail store? Are my costs equivocal there or is there some difference? If you are looking at a Kickstarter, the Kickstarter is not there so much for the profits or for the money. He's more there. Obviously, there are big publishers that also publish on Kickstarter, and they're already more fluent with it. But then for the small little indie board games, they're there to publish a game, and, um, and they sell directly to the end customers. They don't sell through retail. So they can afford to have a higher cost per game while keeping the price reasonable at like $50, $60. Um, but still, they shouldn't have a landed cost of more than a third because they need to take into consideration the artwork that costs a lot of money, the fulfillment, um, the marketing, which was very expensive. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't recommend more than a third of the final cost for the Kickstarter. For me, that answer was great. It gave me a good understanding of roughly how much money I should be setting aside for, uh, to budget for the actual production of my game, should I go down a Kickstarter route. Now, let's revert back for a second and talk about the engagement again. We talked about the fact that, or Hirsch talked about the fact that um, he wanted us to uh, speak with a manufacturer prior to the artwork being created, because then he can give some feedback as to how the board or the components may need to be changed in order to better utilize uh, the, the time, the effort, the money, etc., in producing things. What happens if you don't do that? What frustrated him about turning up with artwork that already existed? Where was the problem in that? I have designers who send me a whole sheet with all their cards in it, in one file. And, and then the sheet is messed up. And then I, I gotta render the whole file again and I gotta uh, take out the cards and it's a lot of work, you know? And, 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 so it's not the right way of working. But then when the designer, if you, because, the guy who does the, the printing engineer, uh, Yang Yuhua, his name is, he does the graphic design for your work. So once you send him, you send a card and you say, this is ca this card, I want 10 times. He will put it in the right way into the printing machine. Okay, so he does, he does that graphic design. All you need to do is upload your art and tell me how many times you want that piece of art printed. And we will set it up. Because sometimes what happens, especially with offset printing, is you have color, uh, color contrast. And if two cards maybe are too close to each other and they're too similar in color, or they have that exact opposite colors, the machine will not be able to catch it. So the graphic designer needs to be familiar enough with print to, to position all the cards and all the components in the right way. And you obviously you cannot expect, even for the big publishers, you cannot expect them to know how to do that work. That's someone who has been in the industry and has worked with offset printing knows how to do. Regular people do not. So if the uh, creator just have his art like separated into pieces, even tokens, you know, a lot of people, they come and they say, oh, I have a token sheet this size. 
but man, maybe it's not the right size of the token sheet, A. B, maybe we can make it a smaller size. C, the colors don't match, the bleed doesn't match, for the cutting it will not be good. If you just send the specific token, say I have 100 of these tokens, I will set them up for print. Okay, so we've had our initial conversations, we've had our artwork produced, uh, once we've had the guidance, the artwork's been transposed by the graphic designer in um, Hirsch's team, and we now have everything ready to produce our uh, sample. A sample is a prototype in effect. It's the collection of all the components together as a representation of your game. If I've got faith, and if Hirsch has got faith that his mechanisms and production team are doing a good job, do I really need a sample? Large publishers don't need a sample because they know how their game will look. They confirm all the art uh, beforehand and they just go with mass, mass production. We don't need to waste any more time. Small publishers, I guess you will need a sample just to make sure that, you know, you envision the game, right? You made the art, you envisioned the game, you thought, you imagined how it will look, but you haven't seen it in real life. So once you get it, then you can evaluate, hmm, maybe I should change the art a little bit. Maybe I should change this aspect. Maybe I should change that aspect. So I would say that the sample is A, or the first reason is to just uh, check the art that you've done and check all the work you've done, just to make sure it looks all right. And the second reason, will be if you're doing a kick, especially for Kickstarters, you wanna have a few games to show reviewers. So they can review your game, they can actually play it, uh, post about it, talk about it, and then you can get more traction for your game. Those are the two main purposes I see for samples, to check your art and make sure you like it and you're happy with it, and uh, B, to promote it on Kickstarter or different, all these different channels. Um, these are the two things I would consider for a sample. Um, aside from this, even if you mass produce a product, we also make a sample first. I want you to know. Before every, every, every piece we make, we make a sample just to make sure it looks good, right? But we don't, we don't compile all of them together at once. We make the sample, we check it out, we, we do it. Okay, and then we go on to the next component and so forth and so on. So we also make samples just to make sure they're perfect, but, um, yeah, we don't, we don't necessarily need to do a whole sample. One thing that I didn't realize is that a sample is just one element of what we as designers or potential designers will see. In actual fact, samples play a very important part in the QA, the quality assurance process for the manufacturer too. Hirsch gave me an example of where, uh, although the designer didn't know about it, Hirsch and his team had spent quite a lot of effort and time and energy in trying to ensure that the quality of what they produced was absolutely spot on. Something that, like I said, the designer, I think, was completely unaware of. For example, we just now made a game, a sample game, for a new guy in the Netherlands, and he has some long tiles that he wants to use for his game. Now, we use high-quality cardboard, but when I look at it, I've noticed that because of the length of the piece, it, it curls up just in the end, just a little bit by like a millimeter. Now, it, it's not a big deal that many games have that curve, but through the sample, I understood, okay, in mass production, I gotta do one out of two things. Either I gotta press it by with a drying machine, so I, I press it for like a week long, not, not a day long, but a week long, just to make sure it stays flat, or I gotta use a much higher level quality cardboard. So through the sample, I learned what I need to do for the mass production so there are no errors in it. Now, just before I draw a close to this video, I want to cover some timelines. Uh, I did ask Hirsch to give me an overview of how long things take, uh, and that's a difficult thing for him to answer because, of course, it totally depends on the quality and quantity of components being used. But I did think it would be a good way of rounding this particular video off. This is what Hirsch gave me as a response to the question, how long does the whole process take? From the time everything is ready, we have a conversation. It takes about three, four days for the graphic design to set up everything for print. Um, after that, you have another 10 days for production for producing the sample. So altogether, the sample will take around 15 days, uh, 10 to 15 days. For a sample, it doesn't really include wood components. Wood components are very expensive for a sample, unless they're standard wood components. Um, if you have wood components in a sample, it can take up to like 25 days. Um, Plastic is not so problematic because we can 3D everything for the sample. And 3D is usually like one day. Um, so 
it's funny enough, but yeah, up to, like the printed components need up to like around 15 days to finish up with the sample. And um, so yeah, sample will be 15 days. We send to you the sample that will be another 10 days until you get it. You confirm every, all the details. Uh, we change whatever needs to be changed. And then we move to mass production. Um, so for those heavy games, uh, like I said, like the underwater cities, even like Catan, um, and those pieces, we're looking at 30 to 35 days, especially if they're wood component rich. So if they have a lot of wood components and you want high quality wood, we're looking at like 35 days for the production in total. Um, 30 to 35 days. Then if your game is like the kind of mid-sized game, um, like three, four components, even five components, um, you can look at 25 days safely. Within 25 days, it will be ready. But then if your game is very light, only cards, um, we can look at like 20 days, we can push it in 20 days. That will be feasible. Um, then there is a fourth, fourth kind of game, which a lot with, um, the, then there is a fourth kind of game that has a lot of miniatures in it. These miniatures, if you make them, making them from scratch, they can take up to a hundred days to manufacture. And the reason why, the reason is because we need to make the injection mold machine for that plastic component. Now, you're shaping a freaking iron glob, yeah? It takes 60 days to do so. And then after those 60 days, you need to have another like 15, 20 days for the actual manufacturing. Um, so, so yeah, just making some miniatures takes up to like 80 days. And on top of that, you also wanna add the assembly in the end. Um, so it will totally, it, will, it can take up to like 90 days Three months to make a game with a lot of uh, with a lot of miniatures. Well, folks, that brings me to the end of this video. A huge thank you to Hirsch, someone who again is not only passionate about uh, board games, but passionate about the manufacturing of board games, uh, which is an odd thing to say in a conversation, I guess. Now, Hirsch very generously has offered to come back and talk a little bit more about the component types, the fulfillment, the shipping, and importantly, the actual manufacturing process. He wants us to understand each element uh, with some level of clarity so we can understand what questions we need to ask our manufacturers when we go ahead and get our games published. Now, I will say that everything to do with Hero Time, which is Hirsch's company, I'm going to try to document and list uh, in the description below. So if you're interested in getting a game published, I heartily recommend you reach out uh, to Hirsch and his team directly. And I'll put links in my description, as I said. Um, but uh, I am going to have Hirsch back. So there is still an opportunity to ask any specific questions you might have about the manufacturing process. If you do have any questions, you know exactly what to do. Put them in the comments below. You know that I'll read them and I'll reach out to Hirsch and try to get an answer for you. Until next time, folks, take care.